Just, you want me to share the screen? Yes. Dream team. <laughs> Hello, Joan. Welcome. Hey guys, I had some difficulty coming in, but let's get. <laughs> Welcome, Stephanie, too. So we are just waiting another three minutes if more people start okay hey stephanie stephanie is one of our pepper friends Come. rafa can you adjust your camera to see your face Come. because it, it's cutting on chin yep it's, it, it was cutting here on yes. my, my square. I am fooling, <laughs> but okay. Uh, I am talking with some guys from from Pepper too. They are saying that they are having some problems to go in. Need to RSVP. RSVP and then I'll, I'll be able to just join. So just let them know RSVP and join. See, I think you can share your screen now. Yeah. And uh, we kick in two minutes, Adam. We kick off in two minutes. Sounds perfect. Okay. Just exit full screen for a tick so I can um, mute myself. Yes, some some friends from from teams here are saying that they can't join the the room. They are having some sort of error. Do you do you reckon Patty that oh now that? I was talking with Harry. Harry is, is here now. Oh awesome. Welcome Harry. Hey Harry.
how many people do you have so far? 14? I can I can count as two. So <laughs> let's round for 15. <laughs> Adam, I think we can start. Let's do that. All right. So welcome everyone to the OutSystems User Group. My name is Aaron Holsgrove. I'll be uh, MC and moderator today. Uh, so I'll be joined with by four of my colleagues at uh, Phoenix DX today. So Sean Mello, Rafael Ranieri, Asama Ghanem, and John Salamat. They're some of our tech leads at uh, Phoenix DX. And uh, we're looking to talk today about tech debt. So do we pay now or pay later? That's the uh, the question that we'll be looking to answer. Now. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. If we move to the next slide. So first of all, uh, if you've never joined the Announce Systems User Group before and you're frantically trying to find where the mute button is, uh, don't worry, there isn't one. So that's why you couldn't find it. Uh, but basically, yeah, we're, we're looking to have quite an interactive discussion today. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. Uh, and if you would like to uh, jump on video and, and, and audio to ask that personally, uh, more than happy to facilitate that. Just let us know in the, in the comments, and we can uh, we can enable that for you. Uh, we'll be looking to um, take your feedback at, at the end of this session as well. So uh, when you leave uh, when you leave tonight's session, you'll get an email to fill out a survey, and I uh, would really appreciate your feedback as well. Let's move on. So. Uh, First of all, I just want to give a little bit of an introduction uh, to, to the session today. So we know that tech debt is the trade-off between short-term benefits of rapid delivery and long-term value. Uh, that's according to Carnegie Mellon University. But as a developer, there's the pressure to cut corners, and it's ever-present. I'm going to invite Shuang to uh, talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, but yeah, look, the, the, the rhetorical questions here we're looking to tackle are, uh, are, they, are these reasons for tech debt? Um, how can we prevent, manage, or reduce and avoid technical debt? Who's responsible for technical debt? And uh, how can you balance speed versus quality when the customer only wants speed? So these are the sort of topics that we want to tackle today. Now, um, what we're going to do is do a bit of a round table with our four tech leads today. And then we want to um, yeah, take your questions uh, as soon as possible, uh, when, whenever applicable. So please just um, pop them in whenever you've got your question. Uh, we're also going to have some uh, questions using a, a little web app called Slido. So, when you see that, you'll see a link to click on in the in the chat to be able to answer a question that we're presenting on screen. Then we'll be able to see our answers in real time. We're also looking to play a bit of a game uh, at the end of this session as well using a system called Kahoot. Again, you'll just have a, a very simple uh, website to click on uh, from the from the chat there, and uh, it'll be just some multiple choice questions, a bit of fun at the end. Okay, so let's dive in. Don't worry about that QR code. We'll be able to give it to you later as we um as we dive in. So Sean, why don't you kick us off with uh, a bit of a, a couple of minutes about uh, what you believe technical debt is? Of course, happy to. Um, so I think, I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic. And I've, I've, I've been um, working closely with it ever since I joined my, my tech lead career. Um, and because it's something that's always present there when when you're involved in in a soft engineering uh, in a soft development um, project, it's it, it's inevitable. It's always there. Um, I've recently uh, given a talk about uh, technical debt, and I went very deep into several concepts. We're fortunately not not going to have the chance to go that deep today. But um, I, I I've been thinking of just bringing one one of the most um, annoying experiences I've ever had with technical debt. It happened like 10 years ago um, when I was, uh, you know, I, I used to be a product owner in a team. It was actually 
in my in my previous life before our systems uh, I used to be a product owner in a team, in a team uh, with um, a big job application uh, I was back in my country in Brazil uh, I, I used to work for the public health care sector uh, in Sao Paulo one of the biggest cities in, in Latin America uh, so it was a big system a mission critical system um, we used to have 10 or 12 developers uh, all Java developers in the project and in the middle of um, I don't know I think we've been we had been live for five or six years already when government came up with a requirement uh, for us to incorporate uh, to embed a big module that had been developed by by another organization um, and we just needed to incorporate that new module into into the legacy app we we had already been building for five years turns out there was a big there was a political a big political pressure uh to have that that going um we did do a um you know good technical job bringing that new module in but um we did need to accept a lot of technical debts so we we ended up having a big mix of technologies different technologies in in, in the same landscape in the same application a lot of knowledge gap as well because the module incorporated into the new app uh it was super complex uh not only from a technical perspective but from a business uh perspective no one involved in the in the original uh, team was involved in that migration uh, in that merging project so we really needed to figure out a lot of stuff um as we went along um Needless to say, a project that has had originally been estimated in five months took more than two years to, to get done. And um, very tricky, very tricky. And after the whole integration with all the knowledge gap and all the technology challenges, um, I think the biggest takeaway for the whole team was uh, we realized that every new release was taking us like 60% of our testing time just for regression testing, because anything we changed in the application was really a, a Pandora box. It was a, you know, we, we used to find a new rabbit holes on every change we made just because of that um, pressing, urgent project to merge things that we kind of couldn't handle. Uh, we, we didn't have control, we didn't have the knowledge to, to handle it. So it was something that the team needed to deal with for um five more years when i was in, in in the project um and it was it was really tough so it really is like technology agnostic it it, it, it um irrespective of what technology you're dealing with on on what the skills of your team um have it's all about identifying preventing and managing technical debt because the dollar is going to be there um and the big uh lesson learned by the whole team was um we didn't deal with uh what we knew was going to become a technical debt uh, properly um because we really kind of accepted the, the political pressure uh to just get that done uh turns out it was way more complex than we we had anticipated um and perhaps if we if we had addressed the risks with a good communication with a good um engagement with with the clients with the stakeholders with all, all the involved people we might have um been able to have had been able to uh, mitigate some of the risks up front um and you know just a very late message with that experience was you know now after eight or ten years i left the, the that project uh the application is still live surprisingly enough and they're still handling the same technical depths i have very good friends in that team well that's the good news i have made very even on the other side of the road so they keep telling me well you know that module yeah it's still giving me headaches so that was a very very interesting challenge just summarizing what the challenge was and what the problems were was pretty much a mix of technology, knowledge gap, and a team that was not yet ready to deal with technical debt when they showed up. Uh, that was a per perfect formula for, for what happened. So, 
uh, super costly and super stressful for all, all involved. Yes, so Sean, I, I thought your story was a really good one to start with because, you know, I, I, I'm keen to talk about systems at the moment, but, you know, we know that technical debt can happen anywhere. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to take your thoughts on, yeah, you know, if this was an out systems project, how this could have been different. And, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I guess just um, you, you talked before about lots of lessons learned, but if you just had to say the number one thing that you wish could have been done differently, from the beginning to really save a lot of that pain and angst that you described what do you think that would be uh, look i didn't have that option at the time uh <laughs> but um if there's one thing that I, i'm pretty sure that all, all the developers in the project would be hands down would hands down agree with me was a technology mix because in the end of the day we ended up having a like a real salad of of acronyms and technologies and not only acronyms uh, like java technology because it, it was really a mix of frameworks there was a bunch of frameworks but it was a big dimension of frameworks because we had frameworks that was already aged like 10 years uh we were dealing with a bunch of technology but with, with a bunch of different versions of the same technology as well and that was super tricky for the devops especially for the devops for the guys handling um compatibility um analysis um framework and library versions it was really really tricky really complex to manage uh yeah, right. that's why we, we we could only deliver a version but in the middle of the migration every two months um and i think if, if i could pick a magic solution i would pick something that would manage compatibility between libraries and versions and components automatically that I, I wouldn't need to worry about that. Um, so that for me was top one um, problem. And so um, j just for some context for the audience, you know, you're discussing a medical solution. Like if you had to estimate, say, in Australian dollars, how much do you think, how much worth of development do you think happened over those five years? That That's hard to say. <laughs> like $10 million, $8 million? Um, easy. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. when you when you're describing different mix of technologies and stuff like that, would you say that uh, everyone was too terrified to try and upgrade, you know, Java two Enterprise Edition? Yeah. Look, when, to, you know? when I joined the project it was two thousand and I don't want to do the math. Uh, but when I joined the, the project, the application was already six years old. Yeah. Um, so it had already uh, been gone through inception, discovery all the business model stuff and um you know it used to have 30 people involving developers and and business um smes business experts domain experts then they started the, the project started sprinting after two or three years um I, i'm talking about a big system in, in a public yeah. in the public sector so everything moves a bit slower um and after the project started sprinting that's when i joined so it was pretty much we used to have like a 10 12 uh, developers and testers in the team um and then after a few years when we kind of got to get got to get good grasp of the of the, the monster we we're dealing with and we got a good control of the, over the system after a few years we that's when we onboarded our systems to build a new module that had nothing to do with the, the original um, challenge but we yeah. started building subsystems in our systems integrated with the with the legacy system. That was back in 2013. Uh, that's yeah, right. when I got involved with our systems and and so on. So we started delivering kind of you know same level of value uh, with a team of four or five people, um, and having a, a a better grasp on 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 technical debt at, at the time. But so our systems ended up saving the day, huh? Well. Uh, I, I had a, a big team, a, a very good team. I could rely on, on very good professionals at the time as well. Um, but yeah, I think the technology mix um, after this platform it helps a lot. So look, and, and last question, Sean. I, I know that you've worked on systems, you know, fairly comparable in size to that since uh, on out systems. What's been your experience in tech debt mitigation without systems compared to that one? Look, I think, well, I, I had the, the experience to, to use, I've been using OutSystems since 2013, so it started at version 8. 
and I started with the Java stack. Um, not, you know, it should be transparent. Uh, it was supposed to be transparent. Uh, but my point with this is that I, I had the exposure to um, some technology stack challenges. Um, and I had experienced that on, on both stacks. And what I can say is that our systems um, progressed a lot in the last few years. Um, I think what, what we're seeing now, the tools that have been made available to our systems developers lately, like uh, the architecture dashboards, um, some of the, the um, AI augmented functionalities, uh, better validation uh, in design time, these are all just a reflection of the maturity that the platform got in, in, in the last few years. Uh, but it, it comes from, from a background of, of a, lot of a lot of struggle, not only technology-wise, uh, but, um, you know, every soft development project had, has its own um, challenges. Uh, from a, you know, soft skills perspective, a huge um, skills shortage in the market. The IT industry is struggling a lot with that. Um, there's always maturity um, gaps as well. A lot of companies not not really ready to face the the, the challenge that delivering software with good user experience, um, fit for purpose, um, represents nowadays. So it really you know technology helps a lot, but um, that there's a lot of challenges around that that needs to be covered as well. All right. Asama, I know you had a similar story to tell, uh, and it was an OutSystems platform, wasn't it, where uh, some uh, technical data accumulated on quite a, combined, uh, a complicated layered approach. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Um, it's very interesting, actually, because tech, tech debt is a universal concept, but everybody and every team might deal with it a little bit differently and face a little bit differently. Um, yeah. on, for, for me, one of the first examples, and you're exactly right, Aaron, that comes to mind is uh, working on a project uh, with, with a client um, where, we, uh, where we are building applications and building new functionalities for existing applications, but those uh, functionalities are being driven by their own client's requirements. So what would happen is uh, there would be, for example, be already an established application that we have up and running in production, and a customer would be very close to adapt, a customer of that client would be very close to adapt, uh, adopt the application. However, it would be just a few functionalities short or a few, a few changes short before they can fully go aboard the digital transformation journey with that client. So what, what happens is they would reach out to this client and say, you know, this app is amazing and, and it's good to go for us. It's almost good to go for us. However, there's only one change we want to see in your application um, that is most, most usually it's tailored for them for that particular customer, it's not something that's generally available at the start, generally required at the start. Um, and uh, there will be, you know, if you only had that one piece of functionality there in your app, we would, you know, jump on this as soon as possible. And what would happen then is we would come in, we would assess that functionality. Of course, we want to make sure that our, our applications being adopted as by many customers as possible. So we'd assess the functionalities um, and then we'd start building that new features that the customer requested. Um, and of course, it's usually driven by their own requirements or their customs requirement, making it very much tailored to that particular customer. And what ends up happening is we develop the functionality, we release it to production. It's all good to go. The customers come on board, uh, awesome, good things. And as time passes, this particular feature starts to grow slowly as well. Um, again, being driven by those business tailored uh, requirements coming from that client. But then it reaches a stage where um, this new feature that we originally introduced for that one client is something that um, we want to be able to open up to many clients, not only this one client that requested originally. So what happens is we uh, have to start looking at how we can unpack and open up this particular functionality to be accessible by as many clients as possible, by potential clients as well. Um, and what that means that uh, there is now tech debt that's occurred because um, the way this particular feature was built was only for that one client, right? Um, and that's where we have to go back to the drawing board. Do we do our diligence when it comes to architecture reviews, when it comes to uh, analyzing the underlying infrastructure so we can slowly abstract all of the concepts within that feature that we built so it becomes more accessible for uh, the other customers. Um, and that's that's kind of a, a, a kind of a cycle that goes on in a particular um, 
uh, field, which is which is okay, which is which is fine as long as you know we're yeah. we're aware that you know we have to come back to this in the future and uh, we have that in, in our minds when we first build this, and then that, that's all right. As long as it's manageable, that's that's all right. Yeah. So it's always the good one that uh, the Swifty that they get gets pulled on you that it, it's custom software until they decide they want it to be white labeled or or generic software, yeah. and you've got to try and take all the customizations out of custom software. Um, so. And that was an our systems platform. It, it just in your estimate, how long did you think it would it took you to, yeah, make that custom software not custom anymore and white labeled in our systems? How long do you think that took to take? I think it, of, of course it depends on the functionality. However, something I can yeah. say for certain is we definitely got better at it, better at it because once we realize that this is a cycle, that's not something that's going to happen only once. Mm -hmm. um, these new features that are enhancing our existing application. They always start by being requested by a particular client in a particular scenario, and then eventually grow to be an, a, a core component of the application. There's a pattern going on here. And what, what we start to, to realize is when we get those types of requests, we have we keep in mind that you know in the future, this particular unique functionality might eventually grow uh, to be part of the application's core components. And um, as, time, as time passes, um, the time required to transform this unique feature into something that is more globally accessible uh, has decreased. The time needed to address the stack that and you know get it up and running with the existing application. So I guess uh, in, in what I'm parsing from what you're saying there is that uh, effectively for about the amount of time that you asked for to take the custom out of the custom software, you managed to sort of future proof their future proofing of uh, what they wanted as well. Um, now, I know, Asami, you have a bit of background in Java as well. If you just imagine the same circumstances you're in and now apply Joel's story to yours, how much longer do you think it would have taken to, to, to do uh, what you did in Java rather than in OutSystems? I, can, I can't start imagining, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a completely different story. Um, of course, you have a lot of uh, tools and practices and um, artifacts that our systems provide out of the box um, that you yeah. can use to assist with that kind, kind of activities, especially when it comes to, you know, refactoring an architecture or refactoring data model integrations or whatever. Um, and because of those tools that you, you, you are given from day one, uh, you can very easily uh, address tech that like that, for example, um, and mm -hmm. ensure that you don't you know, have a quick turnover for these kinds of activities. So no, this is definitely a a big difference, I think, in terms of uh, experience when it comes to the development teams. I think an even better question than how much time difference do you think it would take is what kind of difference do you think would have been there being in the morale of the team that you worked in to try and do something like that or that you did in Java rather than in our systems? Look, I think because of those tools, um, uh, the the team itself and all the practices that the team that the team does become very frictionless because there's very little barriers to um, to overcome the issues at hand because of you know what the, what the tool provides out of the box because of the accelerated way of development um, and and because of that and because we hit less issues because there's less barriers um, it, there becomes less problems to talk about essentially and that yeah. consequently of course raises morale and, and makes things easier to work with. And, and you still got all your hair, so you know clearly you didn't rip it all out, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's yes, I didn't because I, I shaved two weeks ago, and uh, if we did this two weeks ago, then the answer would be. Right, I reckon I've been dealing with technical debt more uh, longer. Than <laughs> yeah. Seems like Joan was the champion. <laughs> yeah, cl clearly you've worked with um, Java for quite a while, Joan. Yeah, my, my okay, I'll take that as a question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, see, I think we've got. Um, I think it's a good to, uh, segue now to a Slido question. Let's do that. Cool. And we've also. I've just dropped the link into the chat, and I'll also share my screen where you can do the old QR code. So are you able to openly discuss tech debt with your client? Please start answering. You go to slido.com, enter in that number, or just click, or just scan in that QR code with your phone. 
All right. Yeah, just some, so, some quick context on this question. And the reason why we asked this question is um, it not, it's not, not hard to find clients that don't even want to face the um, the fact that their project has technical debt, right? Um, uh, I think it's a, it's a culture that comes from, from old cultures where you need to, um, old industry, sorry, where you need to plan something and, and build it accordingly. Perhaps it's a, it's a heritage from um, engineering where you need to plan, design and build accordingly and there's no space for things going wrong. So yeah, that's where this question comes from. Thanks for that, Sean. Yeah, wow. So the answers are rapidly changing here. Lots of no's. Thank you for your honesty, everyone. And uh, I think I think the movement on the answers there is is about uh, as much as we're going to see. So it depends on the person. Now, um, Rafa, are you surprised that that's the the collective answer of the audience? Yeah, uh, actually, I I totally understand that it depends on the person. Uh, I like f f the, I like to think of tech debt as a. Uh, let's say as using a credit credit card something that you use get the products in the moment but you have to pay later right mm. and the fact of you have to tell your wife for example that you just use it all your hinge of the credit card can be hard right so it really depends on if you you have a, a let's say a, a wife that understands you and supports you or not so <laughs> I, I totally understand the answer from the audience uh i, I see that that can 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 depends a lot but the same way that we use a credit card i would say that the tech debt can be manageable Right, Depend, depending on the responsa responsibility that you have, if you you know that you are buying something expensive or in in, in times, you you can manage, right? So the good thing about our systems, in my opinion, is that you have a very good discount. <laughs> you know. You you can you can manage it in a in a very cheap way and easy way, comparing with others uh, tools, for example, like Java. Uh, I will I will share with with every everyone and please, everyone, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to jump in the chats. I am open to to discuss, but I will sh share with you some some samples that I have when I just started without systems, for example, uh, when back back in 2015, when I did my first project without systems, uh, out systems for me just appeared out, out of the blue. I had I had no idea what out systems was. And I started to to de develop without systems. And my team was a ve very junior team. So uh, we, we were three developers and one tech lead. And to add an extra sauce in the project, the tech lead was in Portugal. And all the rest of the team was in Brazil, where I am based in. Uh, I am Brazilian. So we, we had something that um, we, we didn't know a lot and we also had a tech lead away from us so the guidance that we had on the project was basically something like create a module and develop go 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 for that and because of that we started using just one module 
like we, we did all the development the development in just one module and that created a huge tech debt because we just created a monolithic application and when we started to understand a little bit more about our systems and how uh, it should be used we could see that oh man we just exploded our credit card you know we, we just uh, use it too much credit card but then we had the bank which is the out systems and we could uh nego negotiate a, a, a cheaper let's say uh outstanding value because out systems uh, helped us to to refactor the application in a very easy and fast way uh so i would say that out systems helps a lot especially now uh in 2015 we didn't have the the tools that we have now especially now with all the tools that out systems provide like architecture dashboard uh discovery now we can do uh, very fast uh, and better refactorings so i think that's it uh regarding the, the my experience and and uh, what, what I think about tech debt. So Raph, I know you've, you're being very kind in describing that situation because yeah, you and I've talked about this one-on-one -on -one before, but the reason why I was, I was interested to ask you about the first survey is because I know that this is a really horrible customer, right? Like I, I know I'm asking you as a bit of candy here, but that's okay. We're not naming names, but this, this is one where just the customer really torpedoed this, right? Despite the best talent, despite the best platform, um, they had you guys chasing cars, essentially, right? Um, you'd be able to just share like one example, like a, like a particular example where say something took you know, five times longer than it, should, they it could have just with a bit of common sense. Um, what, what, what you, you mean like, what I, I can you ask again, Aaron? So I guess like question? what, what, what I look for is like, yeah, like with this customer, this is either like a, yeah, um, deliberately self-destructive or just uh destructive through a, through, a, through a complete absence or yeah, like any, any sort of in-depth requirement. Cause this is sort of like, I want this go. You talk to me at the end, yeah. you know? So be able to just like, give us one example where say something just took a lot longer than, than it should have and how it could have been much simpler with a couple of differences, you know, like some very simple differences. Uh, so I think they could, for example, uh, start with some explanation on the four layer canvas back in the time uh, to, to help us to understand a little bit better what we had to do. And just for the uh, benefit of the crowd, could we just, just go cover what the four layer canvas is? And the four layer canvas is a uh, architecture uh, model that our out systems uh, suggests to use. The mm. four layer layers were back in the past orchestration, core, uh, orchestration and user core and library. Mm -hmm. These four layers was uh, before out systems eleven. After out systems eleven, they simplified that for just three layers. So the orchestration layer basically disappeared. So we just have the core, the, the end user core and the library. And uh, the reason for that, for, for them to separate layers is that, that we can, let's say, create each module with his own nature and prevents avoids some life cycle issues or some the uh, high uh, a strong couplet dependencies so this also helps a lot to prevent that tech debt in my case in the past if we started to follow since the beginning 
the four layer canvas or three layer canvas now or architecture canvas which is the name that they are using now i think we could have prevented if, if not all at least 90 percent of our tech debt that we had back in that project so i, I think i think just just um echoing rafa's uh, and adding on top of it like it, i think it's um what he's referring to is is pretty much pretty much related to how you can prevent technical debt because it um you know by preventing technical debt i mean uh, making good use of best practices uh making sure knowledge is spread across across teams um the architecture canvas or, or or the layered canvas it is it's really just a framework or or, or methodology um with some very clear guide how you architecture how your architecture application in order to avoid common pitfalls and in order to leverage best practices and leveraging best practices and knowledge out there uh, is is really the best the best way to avoid um to prevent technical that that from happening uh so i think it's a it's a really important point in the in the tripod of preventing identifying managing tech debt um and i think it's a very important um feedback yeah you, you're starting to see some key themes emerge you know like my questions have been really deliberate in in getting these themes coming out of what we're all talking about here because when you talk about technical debt the general assumption particularly if you know when you're speaking to customers that are generally let's say not technically capable that's why they're using consultants such as yourselves but you think of technical debt and they would think oh there's stuff that's bad in the technology but when you talk about root cause of technical debt it's usually human error right and uh, you know in rafa's example here it's it's that old saying of uh, functional requirements versus non-functional requirements and uh it's interesting how uh out systems isn't just an ide and you write some code in it and hit generate um they supply the whole framework of how to do project delivery really well and obviously that software development is, is one part of it. You know, I always say uh, development is one quarter of a development solution. The other three quarters, planning, testing, and documentation, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, sure. I, I'd be interested to, to hear uh, your thoughts as like uh, an example where, um, yeah, like making, taking advantage of the four layer canvas. I know it's basically a three layer canvas now in our systems 11, but yeah, the, the principles remain, but yeah, like a, do you have, do you have a, like a super quick example you could describe of where we did an initiation up front, we, we got the functional, non-functional requirements, and then we went, bam, and out of it. If, if I may jump in the, this example, if I have a very interesting one. I'm pretty sure everyone here know, knows what I'm talking about. And um, we, we just had an architecture review today with, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting because Osama, Raf, and myself were in a, an architecture review today in one of our clients. And we were talking about that. Uh, we are considering refactoring one of, a, of uh, an application we've been, we've been building for, for a few months. And this refactoring will involve moving uh, data objects um, across modules, um, renaming some data objects and, and moving them among our, um, modules. And I think if, if you've been working with our system for, um, for a few months, you've already realized that it's it's not that um, easy or really a good practice to be moving data objects around, especially if your application had, had gone live already. Um, you might face some issues. And the big advantage of having a good architectural um, analysis up front as soon as possible um, in the game is that you have a good a good uh, modularization of the applications that you, you can um, create future ready components so that you avoid moving strategic or core concepts, uh, especially data entities across projects, because the cost of refactoring these um, um, with these kinds of, of tasks, these kinds of changes in the application is way higher. So the big, the biggest advantage of having a good architectural um, analysis up front is you avoid the common pitfalls. That's the pretty much the best, um, the best advantage of it. All right, thanks, Sean. So, so, so I think we, we can um, do our next Slido question. Let's throw to the audience.
All right, how does your client react to technical debt? This should be a good one. I'm going to do this myself. Yeah. These are the kinds of wife that you can have, right? <laughs> yeah. Slowly being eaten by that <laughs> hatred. <laughs> yeah, perhaps the, the 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 fact that they hate it is a, is a bit obvious. Like no one no one likes it, right? <laughs> So this is a, that's a, that's a pretty pretty interesting mix of answers there. Yeah, it looks like it's a, they hate it, but it, but appreciate it's inevitable. It's looking like the winner there. Yeah, yeah even more people are finding that's the answer. Yeah, I think the fact the fact that uh, the the last option didn't have any any answer it means um, at least this audience here has been dealing with with pretty mature clients. Yeah, see, so I think it's fair to assume that. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, that, I think the most surprising response to this survey is that not a single person answered. They have no idea what it means. Yeah. So it's yeah, like when we think about like how we started this discussion today, we were saying what is technical debt and how do you avoid it? Well, the one thing that we know in in this in this group of people here is that we're all people who are working with people who all know what it is. It's just the fact that it's happening. And so I think that's a great segue to you, John. I know you have a great story to tell where, you know, technical debt happens, but there was a great outcome, right? Yeah, thanks for that, Aaron. Lovely to hear about the different stories that you guys share. Um, like, I would say I've been lucky so far to to experience this, this kind of stuff because, um, these problems and this this debt or, or or as how rafa described it like a credit that, that we got uh is something that that got a lot of, of learning experience as well it surfaces that that information where, where we learn and, and do do adjustment on the things that we're doing and and being uh the one who experienced like um, a long-term project um like more than a year kind of project in our systems in which uh, you could see technical debt incurring from from an app that's just built at three months and got released where there's like a very minimal technical debt maybe zero warnings in there if you got lucky enough but as the application grow you you could see that it's an inevitable uh things will happen and there are things in the processes and and tools that out systems offer where we could leverage on and and see how how we could make use of that sprint by sprint to 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 reduce that technical debt that, that we are incurring um and and typically um just like the answer to the survey um customers or or products would be driven by features and bugs technical debt in, is invisible on on that equation so uh, the 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 primary way to to with which I experienced the primary way I, I I did it is by surfacing those technical debts through different uh, platforms that that that's in there. Like uh, on our case, we we've, we've been making use of Jira. I'm pretty sure a lot of us are familiar with that tool. So um, by by including code review in our processes, we would know that a technical debt is is happening on a specific uh scenario and so while 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 you may have that in mind while you have that um technical debt that you know that's it's in the code there's there's a decision that needs to be factored in whether are, are you still do you still have the proper time to address it how is the criticality of that technical debt in terms of the impact that it will bring to the application? So those different parameters need to, to take an into account and, and more likely, if possible, um, address it. But if not, just, just 
as, as I would advocate things, just please have it in the backlog with the right description so that uh, you can get back to it and address it later in time. And I just realized I education, education, education. Uh, we, we need that in, in place in terms of the sprint deliverables. Technical debt is, is uh, typically forgotten, like sprint by sprint. It, it's, it's something that needs to be reminded to, to the team that we need some space uh, to address technical debt. So at least I've been lucky that uh, so far within a release, we're like addressing a quarter of our time to, 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 to get technical debt and, and fix them, uh, especially the critical ones that deals with security and performance. And, and uh, as I mentioned, a lot of tools that are available, the uh, Jual, Rafa, Osama already mentioned those. And, and I think uh, there are still improvements that we could make in terms of processes, um, especially giving time and educating the, the customer. What a concept. You actually planned to deal with technical debt during the project rather than just leave it at the end. So about a quarter of the time, you say? Yeah. So, Sean, going back to your story, imagine if you planned a quarter of the time of your first version of your app deal with technical debt. How many years of pain do you think you would have you've been able to take back? Yeah, that's that's an interesting aspect of it, and uh, it reminds me of, of when I, I started my career and uh, I had made a call of working with, with security rather than than software development. And at the time when I I, I researched a lot about security and I studied a lot, uh, and there was that hidden cost of of security, like uh, the fact that a company is not um, never attacked. Does it mean that the their security processes are uh, the, the uh, top notch or the best uh, world class and it avoided the company from being attacked? Or does it just mean that no one is interested in attacking the company? Uh, and therefore, it's it's hard to justify uh, the investment in security. And it's hard for businesses to see the return of an investment. And I'm just doing this analogy because it's it's pretty similar to, to technical debt. Like, um, you, you can invest a quarter of a sprint uh, worth of effort in, in mitigating technical debt, um, but how is how's the client going to perceive that, right? The, 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 the fact that um, you don't have a terrifying volume of, of tech debt, uh, how, how is it going to be perceived? It really depends on, on culture, education, like, like John is saying, like, um, I've been working the last one year in, in a big client, in a, in a big, uh, big project, um, in a very, um, critical application. And I noticed that halfway through the way the client perceived technical debt and, and the, a lot of other technical challenges as well, it changed completely, changed completely. Like in the very first, um, I mean, three or four months in, in the project, I would answer the second question as um, they hate it. They have no idea what, of what technical debt is and they, they're terrified. So I would use three, three of those answers in the last question because it was really a matter of education. And as we went along and we, we started socializing, communicating, articulating that we would need to address it. Uh, it became a bit clear uh, that we can speed up things if we tackle them um, early in the, in the game. So the perception game is, is super important and it has to do with communication, education, and that, um, that ability to make the client see, see things through your lenses. Uh, that's, uh, that's super important. I think, you know, the, the consequence of, of not dealing well with that is that you always go into a rabbit hole of how, how to, pro how to prioritize technical debt, right? Uh, yeah. how technical debt Titan can win, um, if he's, if, if it's competing against stories and things that are easily perceived by the client as value, as, as value. May I, may I jump, jump in and ask you a question, John? Um, this is a very, very interesting thing to to talk about. But in, in, regarding the education of the customer or the clients, how do you think it's a good way? Because we, we can talk 
uh, sometimes we can try to show them, but they will not feel until something bad happens, right? And just then they will believe us. So what what you think? It's a That's good true. way. Do, do, do you understand? What you think? Of it's course. a good way to, That's to the... educate the the customer. That's the one million dollar question. To be honest. <laughs> uh I, I don't think there's a right answer that that suits all uh, any any use case and i think john is laughing because i think we discussed a lot about the, about it a few months ago on um how can we how can we convince the client that it's important to prioritize tech items right and what i can what i can say about that is i i can share some experiences and sometimes it's it's uh it's the only option you have is is you need to make them struggle with you. You need to bring them to the party. That's that's the term I've I've been using a lot in the articles I've, I've been writing. Like uh, you need to make them see what you see, uh, but at the same time you need to avoid um, the technicalities that sometimes businesses are not they're not ready to understand things uh, the same way you do. So you need, especially as a tech lead, an engagement manager, or someone with a, with a, uh, some sort of leadership role in the project, you need to have the ability to translate things to the way your client is able to see. Uh, but you, you need, in, in, the end of the day, in the end of the day, you need to speak their language, uh, but you need to make them struggle with you. You need to bring them to, the, to your journey. If you don't mind jumping in here, Aaron, I definitely share the same experience. One of the things that benefit us, benefited us a lot with that original client I was talking about is trying to explain to them the consequences or the, advan the disadvantages and the advantages of uh, tech debt and how that affects business value and what we're trying to develop. So, for example, when I go back to the original uh, example that I gave where, you know, at first we started with functionality for one customer, but we can potentially unlock this functionality for hundreds of customers. Then what does that mean to you as, you know, uh, as a product owner or as someone trying to reach as many customers as possible? If that's yeah. something they want, or we're sure that's something they want, then we have to address this tech debt piece that we're talking about to be able to unlock this potential. And that's how we sometimes tailor the conversation and translate the, uh, hide the technical, the technical side of it. Value and trying to convince them what that can actually do for you. Yeah, yeah. I hear. And, and you know, Joel's reminded me of something like, you know, uh, we're all generally the same age. You know, we grew up in an era where, like, say, in 1998, 1999, uh, Bill Gates, you know, when uh, a Windows Millennium Edition was announced, he, that was loaded, you know, released with a lot of bloat and 64,000 bugs, known bugs, he went to market with that. And Bill Gates actually said, customers aren't interested in bugs, they're interested in features. Exactly. You know, and that's sort of, you know, like for people our age, yeah, this is sort of the, the era of IT that we grew up in, right? Sure. And Windows Millennium was a complete failure, right? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't remember that, yeah. Yeah, I, I know the yeah. story. It's a, zero, it's a zero bug operating system, but a complete, a complete failure from a, from a market user experience perspective. But, you know, so, so John, it's interesting to live back to you. So like with that customer that you described where you're able to sort of spend a quarter of your time on technical debt, is this one of the you know, customers that you're describing where, you know, they knew it was inevitable, they knew what it was and they knew it was inevitable. And I guess, uh, how, how, how did you, how did you talk about that up front as the project was starting to come together and, and what was the kind of feedback or responses you're getting from that customer as you're planning for that inevitability? Sure. Um, there are two paces in this in this um, process, how we were able to get in here. Like the, mm -hmm. the first pace is that uh, we we got an, into a methodology wherein it's more of a project basis where there's that requirement that's given to you up front. And so um, the, the, the requirements that you have seen is, is like you only see maybe part of it like half of it but as you develop it's it's like getting more complex and complex so um given that methodology and and things things are are really uh i would say growing or there's that scope that that's happening um 
we we get them into a situation where it's I, I would make use of this anal analogy where there's a funnel that they need to, to get in in the end so that that funnel really get them into a point where in, they need to think of what really the mvp is what really the priority is um customer always think about like there's a pipeline it's 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 all flattened out it's all flattened out but in the end you they, they, we need to make them realize that um it's it's just a thin layer uh that, that you need to follow through and so um wh when we get there um we, we we need to keep on surfacing this thing and and until we, we we got to that point that's where we pivoted to a different methodology that um we were able to deliver the mvp and now there are things that are really complex because of that growth that we have seen uh we pivoted on a different way where where it's more more agile where things are being worked on as as we progress so that's that's now where we kind of think about not not a fixed scope but rather we'll work towards what the value is in which would include the technical debt plus the features plus the bugs that we need to include in our sprint pay now so that you're not paying later right yeah so that's interesting and so i guess the, the third part of this discussion which is really interesting to have is is technique right so we, we we've been discussing a lot of theory um but i'd be interested to get into the techniques and uh michael samuel you sound like a lovely young man um i see you've got a, a fantastic question there and i'd really love to tackle that and i know has got some thoughts before we do that though i just want to do our third and final slido question so let's jump into that cecilia no worries Okay. What kind of tools have you applied to manage and prioritize technical debts? How's that for segue people? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that was the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. And you can select more than one. Ah, yeah. So this is multiple choice here. Mm. Jira is an absolute champion in Australia. Well, it was built by Australians. So it was built by champions, right? I did not know that. Oh, it was, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but to be honest, uh, um, Back in Brazil, Jira is, uh, it, it, it is, is an absolute champion. So it's not, not only in Australia, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a love or hate kind of tool. I, I know a lot of people that have it, but it really helps managing and, and help technical teams get a good grasp of, of what, what's spending on, on their plates. Mm. So you hate it because it shows you how much work you still have to do. I had mixed feelings about Jira already. I hated it, loved it. Now I live with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm an agile coach, so Jira is both uh, a blessing and an occupational hazard for me. So not a single person so far has said other non-out systems tools. That's really interesting. And 70% of people said the architecture dashboard have helped them to manage and prioritize technical debt. That's also really fascinating. Jira, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, Architecture Dashboard has been uh, super helpful. I think that that, that was a spot on to uh, provide about systems. And to be honest, it was like, a, I think the third attempt after failing twice. Um, our systems had the trusted advisory, which was kind of useful, but not, not really um, hit the target. But I think architecture dashboard, it's, um, it's a consolidation of very mature techniques. Um, and that, as I've been studying technical debt, not only in the systems universe, I see how architecture dashboard has been leveraging techniques from, from, um, from the software industry. And that's why I think it's so much spot on. Um, John, so is architecture dashboard installed by default in the OutSystems online environment when you set it up? Um, it, it's like uh, a part of, of the community application that, that's connected to the lifetime 
So it's it's lifetime plugin. Then you you get to interact with that. Before it's like a part of your environment, but now it's like a cloud uh, SaaS kind of thing where where you, it, the data is just being being pushed through that architecture dashboard and analyze their static code analysis that would run and then would would report those different uh, yeah items that yeah, you right. need to address. So Sama has. has have you got any um, thoughts in terms of how Lifetime has helped you deal with technical debt? Or some examples to share? Um, how Lifetime helped me deal with tech, tech debt. Um, I think one of the key features in Lifetime that we use on a, we use constantly and we rely on it very heavily. And I think all of some projects rely on it heavily is um, the insights, the developer, the deployment controlling this before you deploy um, and the, and the, it, it gives you the insights on what potential might happen if you deploy a particular version of your code into the consequent environment. And that can help yeah. with a lot of issues uh, before your new, version, your, your new build hits that consequent environment. Um, and that's something that's obviously built in by default in Lifetime, and it is extremely useful. Um, and in later versions of Lifetime as well, uh, it has been also been expanded to be able to do a lot of configuration on the fly, if not mistaken, and uh, um, sign side properties before you deploy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it just makes it just makes your life way life way easier. Um, uh, it, it helps you capture and potentially prepare uh, your deployment and handle potential issues before they actually happen. Um, so, just eases eases the process all in all. So, Rafa, uh, have you ever experienced any sort of feature like lifetime with non out systems platforms before? Like, do you think no. anything like that exists with other platforms? uh i i would say not not something by default like lifetime in out systems but we can use some other tools like um uh, jenkins or, or some other tools that helps us to automate site ci cd uh process to have something like we have in, in, in lifetime without systems. However, if you we, we just think what lifetime give to us for free, in, free and in, in, in codes because it's not totally free, but uh, as part of the package, as Osama said, it's a great help. Like it's a awesome help that our systems provide for us when do doing deployments yeah and, and Sean, i i know um you know look Rafa is sort of talking about stuff that you have to spend a lot of time setting up and then make all the lego blocks fit together and the sort of stuff um how do you install lifetime with your out systems environment is it just click a button there you go well now with the clouds it i uh, don't even need to do anything anymore yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, right. our team makes me uh, just puts it ready for me and uh i think the biggest advantage is is that i've never seen anything as integrated as lifetime because it leverages the the outsystems internal metadata so it has control over anything you do um i've i i had contact with what other uh, tools other similar platforms in the market like Jenkins um, uh, TFS in the, in the .NET universe uh, these are tools that aim to automate your DevOps um, um, landscape your DevOps um, activities but not they're not not as integrated as as the experience we, we can get with lifetime um, so that's per se, just um, a big advantage. Yeah, unreal. And so uh, I, was, I, was, I knew ar architecture dashboard was going to come up in this discussion, right? Um, and so I just want to loop back to Mike Samuel's question now. So what's the best way to move forward with technical debt? And let's talk about our systems. Let's talk about our systems applications. How do we move forward with technical debt? Um, Sean, did you have anything to add to that point? Yeah, on top of, yeah, obviously, the, the, the advantage of lifetime? Yeah, sorry, I don't want to um, talk much, although it's super hard for me not to talk much. Um, but I, I just, you know, I, I think it's a very interesting question because uh, it touches a lot of um, points of I've been super keen to, to understand how the how the 
the software development teams, not only the operations world out there are, are, are handling, but uh, the, you know, there's a lot of concepts around the technical debt and, and functional, non-functional requirements, what technical debt really is and what it is not as well. Uh, analysis paralysis is a very interesting point and it has all to do with the experience that Osama just shared with us. Um, they, they decided to build a, an application based on the client they knew at the time, although they had an indication that that product could be extended in the future to, to address other clients, other use cases. Uh, but those use cases were not visible as yet, right? So it, it has all to do to, with the visibility you have at, at the moment and the decisions you make. I just wanted on, on those lines, I wanted to share a quote from someone really important. I'm not going to share my screen uh, just uh, for the for in the interest of in the interest of time, but I wanted to share this quote just um, as some sort of inspiration. Uh, this quote is from a guy called Ward Cunningham. I don't know if you guys uh, know him, but he's he's one of the the he's a co-author in the Agile Manifesto. Um, he is the creator of the first wiki. And he's the one who helped coin the term technical debt. And this quote is very interesting because he says, what, what you're building now is related to the knowledge you have at the moment, right? To what you can, what you can see. Um, analysis paralysis has to do with people trying to guess the future, right? It has to do with you trying to solve all the problems even if you don't have visibility over all, all of them. That's something that the agile methodology has been helping a lot in, in the market, trying to come up with uh, quick delivery, deliver uh, value fast, fail fast. Um, all these methodologies and jargons in the market um, at the moment, they're all linked to the same, to the same idea. Um, and just reading the quote for everyone's benefit, what well, he says is we, we accumulate the learnings about the application over time by modifying the program to look as, as if we had known what we were doing all along, which is yeah. which is crazy if you stop to think about it. And then he says some, something else super interesting as well. It's the same same author, Ward Cunningham. He says, I'm, I'm never in favor of writing code poorly, but I am in favor of writing code to reflect your current understanding of the problem. So it's not about good or bad, right or wrong. It's about writing something useful, meaningful, that delivers value with what you know at the time. Yeah, uh, that's unreal. So I think it's just to, to reflect some, some inspiration and, and Michael, happy to have some beers with you over the, the subject. Anytime. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Sean. So John, how about you? What's the best way forward to move, uh, best way to move forward with technical debt? I mean, clearly it's to poach you as the technical lead of your project because you could smooth talk customers into spending a quarter of the time doing technical <laughs> debt, right? Not all the time. I would say, I'll be honest. It's, it's, it's a hard, hard thing to do. Um, and, and the thing that uh, Joao mentioned is is just bringing things on reality. Like um, there's there's that difference of being incremental and bringing too much architecture up front, just like how agile and waterfall works. So um, just just given that that scenario, we need to just be leaning towards the incremental part and being able to adopt different changes that 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 really that that what good architecture is um it's it's the adaptability of that to different features that the the software would would would, would go into so um i would say it there, there's no no black and white there's no checklist for you to to follow it's the ability of the team to adapt and it's the ability of the architecture also to 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 bring in that those changes and be still flexible in terms of the future. Thanks, John. How about you, Osama? How do you, how do, how do you move forward? How do you move forward with technical data, Osama? What's uh, your quick tips? Um, really quickly, I think one of a couple of things that really worked well for us in the past, um, ensuring that you bring all the stakeholders to, to, to the table. So uh, before you jump into development and 
try to address technical debt, just make sure you have, even if it's very brief upfront, um, uh, you know, uh, like a design phase, uh, just before, you know, you jump into development mode, ensuring you have all the stakeholders involved, especially, um, you know, in a mission, mission critical application, like some other team members uh, mentioned, you need to make sure that, you know, you're resolving this tech debt and not creating something else and in the process. So just to get it right for the first time, ensure have everybody required um, uh, at the table, have that conversation before you start the development. And something else that we also found very useful in the past, um, might be a very debatable topic, but uh, having some sort of documentation, of course, um, as you go through a journey, because I, I, I know there's an agile core value which says uh, having a working code is better than having comprehensive documentation, which is 100% correct, of course, I agree with that. But uh, maintain very high level, you know, architecture diagrams, very high level integration diagrams, maybe data flow diagrams here and there, just for the core concept of application, and go a really long way for maintaining the knowledge within the team, um, especially if, you know, projects can span for years and years, and ensuring that the knowledge is documented somewhere um, is uh, can, can be very, very valuable. Yeah, the middle ground there is to, to, uh, to documenting developer intent, not writing a novel about what you did, right? Just a quick comment on doc documentation. I agree with for, uh, uh, your point, Azama. Uh, just just make sure that documentation doesn't doesn't uh, become a source of technical debt for you. <laughs> <laughs> and Rafa, just lastly with you. Um, so imagine Charles just called you up. He's in his job uh, with that medical client. He's in hell, and he calls you up. And says Rafa, I, I need your help. I need your advice. How do I move forward? What's your advice? So, so Aaron, I, I, I think the best thing to do, as everyone said, and João very well said, is to bring the stakeholders to the party. Uh, however, uh, some, something that I have saw, I have seen in the past, and is very common, is that some sometimes us as tech leads or as developers, we are afraid to, to call, to, to ask the, the, the customers to join us because we think that they think that we should know, that we should be the, the, the person that would prevent that, right? However, as João, again, very well, uh, shared with us about Ward Cunningham. <laughs> yeah, mate. Uh, we we do the things what with what we have the understanding of, right? We we do the things uh, with what we have what we know in that time. So what what we have to to also make the customer understand is that when we say or when we we ask them to join the party is because we know what the problem might be right right we know that that uh that code for example may lead to a a, a bigger issue so we, we we shouldn't be afraid to to tell the clients that we did something wrong or, or not wrong but we did something that we we were not expecting because it's it is uh a way to show expertise because other otherwise if we were not experts or if we were not uh good uh workers good employees we wouldn't know that 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 we did can lead to a, to a bigger issue. So the best uh, thing, in my opinion, is to always share the responsibility. Uh, don't have afraid to tell uh, the, the customer that you, you need to do a refactor or, or something because it will be uh, for the best. And what I would say to João is that, first of all, try to keep your hair on your head because <laughs> it's a... Uh, a great indicator of tech devs <laughs> and try to join uh, the, the try, try to ask the customer to join the party. Yeah, you, yes, right? Huh? <laughs> what? We'll talk again in 10 years. 
no problem. No problem. Uh, th thank you so much, Rafa. Because you remind me of the yeah one of the agile values is uh, customer interaction over contract negotiation. The worst type of project is where a customer is involved at the very beginning and the very end and spend the six months in the middle where their fingers cross going, uh, our tech guys are handling it. So yeah, beautifully said. All right, so we've got seven minutes left. Let's jump over to Kahoot and bring it back to the audience. We've got some fun questions to ask you. So uh, just in the chat right now, folks, you'll be seeing uh, a URL you can join here. So kahoot.it. Uh, this code 8576103 you just enter that in at the website there and uh, what you'll see is that once you jump into the game your name will be appearing on screen so we'll just give that a a, a minute or so just to um get you all jumping into to the kahoot website and uh and then we'll dive can in. we also play arrow uh you might yeah, be surprised but you can play yeah you guys can play I, I've seen the questions and uh, I know that um, being a technical lead won't give you any advantage in this, in this is what I would say. All right. Thank you everyone for signing in so far. We'll give that just a couple more seconds. All right. Let's go. I think we've got everyone we're going to have. Let's dive in. So question number one. What is technical debt, folks? By the way, the quicker you answer, the more points you score. So sometimes you just got to take a leap of faith. What is technical debt? Four seconds left. Two, one. It's the green and one. It's the green one. <laughs> that almost everyone got it. The trade off between short term benefit of rapid delivery and long term value. Well done, everyone who got that answer. Let's check the scoreboard. And is that Mike Samuel? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Question number two Gartner's definition of technical debt is. 18 seconds on the clock. We've got three it's answers the already. One. Well, we've got some. Oh, it's the green one. Uh, you're just saying green because, because that's on the Brazilian flag. <laughs> <laughs> and, ooh, everyone was split on that one. So Gartner's definition of tech debt is the deviation of an application from any non-functional requirements. Interesting. There we go. See, I told you being a tech lead won't give you advantage. And now Joao's in the lead. How about that? Okay. Joao did the questions. No, Let's he's not on. fair. He didn't. Let's move on. I did. What percentage do companies spend from their IT budgets on tech debt? It's the now, green one. I know half, most of you in the, in the audience right now, you can't unmute to make an audible groan. But take a guess. What do you reckon? Um, I must admit, guys, I'm super biased. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it was 41%. That's, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. We By the way, this information, check. this information comes from, comes from our market research, our systems conduct. <laughs> so super interesting about technical debt, uh, the growth threat, threat of technical debt. interesting reference. All right, thank you for that. Checking our leaderboard, and Jean is still in the lead. Okay, interesting. Feeling like so, cheating. technical debt threatens what? 17 seconds on the clock. It's your time to shine, Rafa. It's the is green, it green one. one, Rafa. It's the <laughs> green one. <laughs> it's five seconds, four, three, two, one. We've got 10 answers. And 
Oh, yes. It was the green one, Rafa. See? Ooh. Yeah. You'll eventually strike green. So, John, I take that back. Everyone doesn't need to steal you. They need to steal Rafa <laughs> for the next project. And there goes Joao. And Roger is in the lead. Well done, Roger. Let's keep going. According to the Art Systems Tech Debt Survey, what is not a cause of technical debt? 18 seconds on the clock. This cartoon isn't going to help at all. It's just going to distract you. It's what do you reckon, one. folks? Yeah, we've got uh, a lot of people quick on the, the trigger there with answers. Two seconds. And the answer is messy code. So about a third of people got that answer there. Let's check the leaderboard again. And all right, this is this is getting interesting. Mike has retained the lead. All right, let's move on to our next question. What is code smell? This is a real thing. What is code smell to four answers now already? Okay, we've got some confident people in, in, in the that you can hit today. And they're coming around the outside, yeah. 400 meters raining. And the answer is, folks, the symptoms of poor design or implementation choices. This is basically the summary of what everyone in our panel said today. And most of you got that right. Well done. Let's check our leaderboard. And all right, they're really juking it out now. It's getting heated here. All right, this is exciting. Moving on. According to our systems, what percentage of companies attribute their major problems to deficits they've, re they've knowingly accepted? What percentage of companies attribute their major problems? Now, again, audible groan, right? <laughs> There's a lot of quick answers here. It's just like, ah, oh, it's probably that. <laughs> So I think you, you'll learn something with this answer. And the answer is 43% of companies attribute their problems to deficits they yeah. knowingly accepted. Look at that. Everyone the, pretty much. Yeah. The green one. <laughs> one is that the green. <laughs> Blame Rafa for that. <laughs> they all look at this. green. Christian's on green. fire. This is getting really interesting. Come on, Roger. I'm pulling for you, mate. All right, next question. According to OutSystems, how much money is robbed from businesses every two minutes by tech debt? Oh. Every two minutes. Well, we know it's definitely hundreds of thousands of dollars, and everyone else does too. We've got 10 answers already. Six seconds remaining. Yeah, we've got our answers locked in, and the answer is... Just over half a million dollars robbed from businesses every two seconds by technical debt. And nobody got it. It's two, oh. two right questions. Oh, not two right oh. questions. Yeah, uh -oh. I agree, yeah. It's actually 720. Well, one's in uh, dollars and one's US dollars. <laughs> That's it. There you go. So now you have a tech debt in your Kahoot configuration. <laughs> <laughs> and look at Christian. This guy, throw a bucket of water on him. He's taking the lead. He's on fire. This is fantastic. All right. And second last question. Does tech debt accumulate? It's the green one. I would say now the blue one because it has the credit card word. <laughs> I did smoke when you brought that up. I <laughs> All right, it's the answers blue one, are locked for in. Sure. It's the blue one. Look at that. Rafa, he's credit, on fire credit too. card is a perfect analogy. Perfect an analogy. That was a planted answer by Rafa too. It wasn't. See if people it were paying was attention. Thanks, guys. Thanks, All right. Financial Last debt. question. For the championship, according to our systems tech deck survey, what is the biggest problem tech deck creates for companies? What is it, people? Jump in with the answers quick. This is the money shots. Four answers now, 11 seconds remaining. And we've almost got our answers. We've got eight, two more people to go, I think. One person still deciding. Two seconds left. One, pick anything. Good on your mates. And the answer is it limits their ability to that. innovate. It was the green one. It was the green one. Go, Rafa. <laughs> and, and I, and I okay, drum roll, yellow. please, everyone. 
drum roll, drum roll, the podium. And third place is Pereira. Congratulations. In second place, Christian. All that bucket water happens in number one. Who is the winner? Ah, Asama! Oh, <laughs> Asama! No! From nowhere! <laughs> there is absolutely an... okay. nowhere. So, folks, internal joke here at Phoenix DX. Asama wins everything. He does. He always wins everything. It's so unfair. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Yes. I tried. I tried my best. I swear. <laughs> who's, who's the top non Phoenix person? Is it Christian? It's Christian. Okay, Christian, well, Christian, Christian you're our winner, but yeah. these people are not getting the prize. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, I hope that was a bit of fun for you all. I know we've gone four minutes over, but thank you so much uh, for sticking around. I hope you got a lot of value out of this discussion today. I hope you had a few laughs too. Uh, that's what we're looking to achieve here. And look, we're going to um, we're going to send a little prize to the winner here as well. So thank you so much for sticking with us and uh, and watching our panel today. Thank you, Jarling, Usama, Rafa, and John. And uh, I'm Aaron. Have a great night or a great day if you're watching from overseas. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. See you guys. Have a good, good night, guys. everyone. Good night, everyone. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.